So hi everybody, my name is Neil Seidman and I'm co-chair of the Public Education Committee for ADAA. That's the Anxiety and Depression Association of America. And welcome to our webinar. The title of the webinar is Health Anxiety Part Two. Learn how to face your fear of death and overcome health anxiety. And our presenter is Ken Goodman. Thank you so much, Ken, for joining us. You are very uh, welcome. These webinars are presented by the Anxiety and Depression Association of America, which is the leading nonprofit organization in the field of anxiety and depression. Our mission is to improve diagnosis and promote the prevention, treatment, and cure of anxiety, depression, and stress-related disorders through education, like this webinar, through practice and research. So please take advantage of just amazing resources on our website, adaa.org. On the website, uh, you'll find a really great list of treatment providers. Just click on the Find a Therapist uh, button. And we also uh, have a free peer-to-peer -peer online support group. So you can take advantage of that resource as well. And then finally, uh, you can support ADA, ADAA by making a small charitable donation right from the website. Let's get started. Uh, hey, Neil. Our, our, yes. This is Sasha. We're getting some feedback in your audio. You're getting feedback on the audio? I do not hear the feedback on my end. Okay. Okay, how's that? Any change, Sasha? It's still a little, no, let's see. Are you still getting that uh, reverberation? Yeah, we're getting a few comments in the chat about it as well. Yeah, I'm not sure there's anything we can do about that. Um, All right. Let me try. Let me try a uh, headset. Shall I try that? That'll just take a minute. Yeah. Any um, noise from my end? I have an air conditioning on. I think it sounds good on your end, Ken. Thanks for asking. Okay. Natalia, do you want to try your audio and see if that's okay? Um. Yes, yeah, so I've been on mute. Is okay. it? Okay. Uh, yeah, Sasha, how does Natalia sound? Natalia, one more time for me. Yeah, am I sounding okay? Yeah, you're sounding okay. Okay, I'm going to try a headset. Let's see if that eliminates the uh, distortion. Thank you, everyone, for being patient as we work out these technical difficulties. Yes, thank you. Okay, uh, Sasha, is that any better? Any improvement? Yep. We're sounding better. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you everybody for being patient. This is the excitement of a live presentation. <laughs> and and you can see we don't do everything perfectly here either. Um, so um, as I was uh, uh, saying, actually, this is a good point to, to pick up on now because more people have joined us. Uh, this uh, is a live presentation, but it's also being recorded. So you have an opportunity to uh, watch the recording. Um, and for our live audience, we want to get your questions. So take a moment to find the chat feature so you can type in a question for Ken as we go. If you're on a laptop, look for the control panel. And at the bottom right of the control panel, you should see a chat option that has a little plus sign. And you can click on that and type in a question there. Uh, if you're on a smartphone, look at the middle bottom of your screen for a chat link. And then finally, if you're on an iPad, look for an icon at the top that looks like figures. Uh, and again, for our live audience, uh, you can type in a question anytime as we go. For our audience that's watching the recording, you can email a question 
and the email address for questions is webinars at adaa.org. Uh, okay, so I'm uh, really happy to introduce our presenter. Ken Goodman is a licensed clinical social worker specializing in the treatment of anxiety disorders and OCD. He's a member of the board of directors of ADAA and he is founding director of quietmindsolutions.com. Ken has authored and produced a 12-hour self-help audio program for anxiety sufferers and it's called the Anxiety Solution Series, Your Guide to Overcoming Panic, Worry, Compulsions, and Fear. Ken also created Rake Free from Anxiety, which is a coloring self-help book. And he just published a new book for overcoming the fear of vomiting, and the title is The Emetophobia Manual. Ken lectures at universities and organizations across the country. In his practice in Los Angeles, <clears throat> excuse me, he does individual and group therapy to help anxiety sufferers free themselves from debilitating fear. And Ken's website is www.kengoodmantherapy.com. So let me turn things over now to Ken. Just take a moment here. And did that pop up on your screen, Ken, to take over the presentation? Yes. Good. There we go. Okay. Coming through great. Is it possible? It is possible to overcome illness and anxiety. What a great start. Yes. Thank you guys for being here and uh, for taking part in this part two webinar. If you have not seen the first one, I recommend that you do. Um, this is a continuation of that webinar. So if you're seeing this one without the first one, you might be a little bit lost, but that's okay. Plow through and then go back and see part one. So I uh, want to thank Natalia for being a part of this webinar. She's a former patient of mine. She suffered with illness, anxiety, and uh, she has graciously donated her time, even though this is finals week for her. So we really appreciate you being here with us. Uh, I think it's really important for people who suffer with illness, anxiety, not only to speak to professionals, but it's so useful to speak with others who have overcome the fear. So you have an opportunity to ask her questions as well. So feel free to type questions in and um, we'll get to them as we go through the through the talk and you'll have plenty of time at the end as well. So um, type whatever you wanna ask is perfectly fine. So it is possible to overcome illness anxiety. And I wanna start off, um, if maybe Natalia, you can share a little bit about what your illness anxiety was all about and how it impacted your life. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Neil, can you turn your audio while we while they're speaking? I'm sorry. Okay, sorry. Can we try to mute your audio while? Okay, Ken let me talks? see if that's the problem. All right, let's try that. Okay. Sorry for the difficulties. Is that better? Yes. Okay. Um. Yeah. I. Thanks for having me here, Ken and Neil. Um, I suffered from health anxiety. I was afraid, anxious about having um, ALS and MS. So it completely consumed my life. I not only was I thinking I had that, but I also had a lot of the physical symptoms that would make me think I had it. A lot of muscle twitching, a lot of leg tingling, um, a whole bunch of physical symptoms and it took over my life like I couldn't be alone anymore I went from living on my own to going back to my parents house um, I wasn't focusing well I was dissociated I couldn't socialize and it took a lot of grit 
and a lot of discipline and support, but also confidence in myself to overcome this anxiety. And I'm happy to be here and to support any kind of, I don't know if phrases or quotes or anything really, like I just wanna let y'all know that it is possible to overcome illness anxiety if you have the right tools and the right therapist. Um, and that's it. Did you, when you started therapy, did you think you were going to overcome it? Mm, you know, I'll be honest, Ken, uh, that's the, it's the only reason why I felt like I was able to overcome it because of your, the credibility that you had and the experience that you had. And I trusted so much in, um, your experience that I knew that this was capable. Um, so I went in with that confidence and thought, okay, I can do it. This is possible. I'm willing to give it a try. I was desperate by the time I- So on a scale of one to 10, 10 being the worst, how anxious were you? A 10, maybe even more. Were you thinking about it all day long? I was thinking it, it consumed every single day, every minute, every second of my life. Completely. Tell us about some of the behaviors that you were doing. Oh, Google searching. You're what? Uh, Google searching the symptoms. So I would get on Google every single day, maybe for 30 minutes, an hour, maybe more. Google the symptoms. I would click on different links, read different articles, read different symptoms. Um, I was constantly aware and checking my body for symptoms. And the more I checked, the more I perpetuated the symptoms, if that makes sense. Um, and like holding your hands out to see if they're yeah, shaking. Hands out, see if I'm shaking, holding even my legs out to see if they're shaking. Um, if I felt muscle twitches, I would focus on those twitches all the time. There wasn't any moment during my day that I wasn't checking. And I know that you were an exercise fanatic and you stopped exercising? Yeah, <laughs> I did. I stopped doing everything. I stopped doing all my normal things like exercising, socializing, um, sleeping alone. I was so afraid that if I did anything, it would manifest the, the illness. Yeah, okay. By the way, um, Natalia is not your real name and you are blurring yourself out, so we're protecting your identity. Okay, so can you tell us now how you are? How are you doing and what's going on in your life and what are you able to do now that you weren't doing before? And on a scale of one to 10, what's your anxiety like now? Yeah, so I moved from California to Boston to pursue grad school. So that's a huge jump for me. Going from, I don't wanna be alone, to now being in a different part of the state or of, of the country um, by myself, on my own, without any close family or friends to, to really support me. Um, and I, I, Maybe on a, from the scale of one to 10 anxious wise, as far as health anxiety, the scale is a one. Um, if that, you know, I don't think about it anymore. It doesn't consume me anymore. Um, I'm not concerned or worried. I do have general like anxiety over exams or papers I have to write, but that's normal now. I'm able to bring my body down from the levels of stress or levels of anxiety. Um, as well. No longer doing any of that checking. No, 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 no behaviors, no compulsive behaviors, no checking, no Google searching. Um, I have no symptoms, no physical symptoms whatsoever. I haven't had them I, for a really long time. Um, I so yeah, that's right. You were you were always like kind of having jitters, right? Yeah. So, yeah. And you don't have that anymore. No, it was constant. The muscle twitching was constant. The, the handshaking was constant, the tingling of the legs were constant, and I don't have any symptoms anymore. And we stopped working together, I think, it must have been May or June maybe, May or June. So it's been, you know, it's a good six months. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, so it is possible to overcome this. So you just have to um, learn the strategy and then implement the strategy, which is challenging, but it can be done. So I want to pick up pick up where way I left off in uh, part one and uh, demand reality. We have to demand reality. Um, when you go to your doctor, you have to remember that your doctor went to medical school and you have to trust your doctor. It's very difficult to do when you have an illness anxiety. I mean, after all, sometimes doctors do make mistakes, but if you need to, I guess you can get a second opinion on things, but you really need to learn to trust the doctor. You have to accept that your MD cannot give you 100% guarantee. So the MD cannot give you 100% guarantee that you'll never get cancer, or that you for sure don't have ALS. You know, there's always a possibility and we have to learn as just people to enjoy life, you have to accept some degree of uncertainty. So when I get on a plane, I'm accepting some uncertainty. When you drive your car, you are set, accepting some uncertainty. There's no guarantee that you're gonna to get to your destination. So we have to accept that there's gonna be some uncertainty in life. Um, you can't diagnose yourself online. And in fact, one of the things that I told Natalia from the very beginning, where she needs to stop Googling, because the Googling was reinforcing her anxiety. Do you want to talk about that for a I moment? I do. Another thing I wanted to mention, Kim, was I was constantly looking for reasons to go to the hospital and to go to my doctor um, to validate that I was okay, but I really didn't trust <laughs> their word. Um, they could have told me they could they could have taken an MRI um, or or something like that, and I still would have trusted their, their word. Um, yes, yeah, so I Google searching and I mean, I just kept on thinking that it's true, it's true, it's true. Um, and I would so how did you stop? How did you stop yourself from Googling? I, I did everything you told me. <laughs> you told me confront the fears, stop the, stop the behaviors, and just let the fear, just feel the fear, stop the behaviors. So I yeah. listen to you. Yeah. So you have to keep this in mind. There's anxious thoughts and then there's anxious behaviors. And you cannot overcome your worries. You can't stop worrying unless you stop the behaviors first. It doesn't go in reverse. As long as you are doing anxious behaviors, you're gonna to continue to maintain those anxious thoughts, those words. So you have to do everything you possibly can to refuse to engage in any sort of anxious behaviors, like checking, Googling, asking people for reassurance. And once you're able to stop those, you'll start to notice that your worries begin to dissipate because online searching is just feeding the anxiety. It's giving your anxiety a lot of material. So I have a, a comment or a question. Can you hear me okay, Ken? Yes. Great. Uh, so I love this first slide, demand reality. Your doctor's the one that met, went to medical school. And one of the questions that our audience typed in is how do I tell the difference, whether it's a, a real health concern or whether it's health anxiety? And I think you and Natalia have already addressed that. If I have anxiety about my health and I'm trying to figure out, is this health anxiety? That's nervousness bringing up my symptoms or is this a actual uh, health issue? Should I, rely on my doctor or should I become the medical expert with Dr. Google? Yeah, you know, you cannot diagnose yourself online. So that is, you need to stop doing all of that behavior. But in terms of trying to figure out, okay, is this a real health concern or is this my health anxiety? You're, you have to keep this in mind, particularly if you've been suffering with illness anxiety for a long time, That that's what you have. Like if you've had it for 10 years, you know you have illness anxiety. You know you have anxiety, and that's the disorder you need to treat. You might have a symptom, but if it's not diagnosed with anything, it's just a symptom. And therefore, you have to treat what you know you have for sure, which is the illness anxiety. Maybe you get a symptom, 
I mean, you're, you're always going to get symptoms. Remember, the body is very noisy. And so every person on the planet is going to get symptoms sometimes because our body is just noisy. But just because you get a symptom doesn't mean it is tragic or it's going to be lethal or deadly or progressive. It doesn't mean it's going to be any of that. In fact, if you look back over your life, you probably see that most of the symptoms that you've had probably went away without any sort of treatment, without any medicine. They just kind of went away on, its own, on their own. Now, Natalia made a comment when she was uh, talking about her story that uh, her experience today is she doesn't have those distressing physical symptoms like she did. So can physical symptoms actually be a part of illness anxiety? So in addition to our bodies being naturally noisy, and as we get older, we age and different things happen. If you have anxiety, you're going to have more symptoms than the average person because your brain is going to send signals to the adrenal glands as you worry. And when your adrenal glands secrete adrenaline, you're going to get all sorts of physical symptoms. So racing heart, tightness in your chest, difficulty breathing, um, tingling, jitters are a very common symptom of anxiety. So there's a lot of anxiety sufferers who have jitters and they misinterpret those jitters as symptoms of ALS. So um, getting a second opinion or seeing a different specialist might be useful, but that's not something you want to make a habit of. Um, you know, once you get a second opinion, that should probably be it. Uh, trust the test results. Oftentimes people with illness anxiety will have these questions. Well, what if, what if my test was someone else got my blood test and that's not my, that's not mine. Or there's always going to be these what if thoughts. You're always going to have those questions that come up. So if I'm but having when, some physical symptoms and I'm not quite sure, maybe it's some legitimate health concern, maybe it's health anxiety. And I go to my doctor and the doctor does whatever evaluation he wants to do. And he tells me, you know, Neil, you don't have a, a medical condition, then perhaps my condition is illness anxiety. And maybe I should take a take a try at having at treating that issue. Absolutely. You know, I always hear this from patients. I treat a lot of illness anxiety. I hear all the time that it's so hard to believe that this is psychological because it you're actually having physical symptoms. You I mean Natalia, you were feeling jitters all day long, weren't you? Completely, yeah. Um, I think when you explained to me, Ken, that it's a physiological response, it's somatic, um, a lot of it made a lot more sense to me um, because it was caused by stress. And my, my life back then and during anxiety, especially illness anxiety, I was constantly stressed. So my body was constantly um, on alert and I couldn't calm it down, which is what for me, I think if and correct me if I'm wrong, Ken, is what caused a lot of my physical symptoms. So once I learned to stop the behaviors, stopped checking, and once I've learned to, uh, once I learned to calm down that my body, then a lot of my symptoms went away really quickly. Absolutely, that's right. And it's oftentimes, sometimes the response can make it worse. So for instance, if you have a fear of breast cancer and you feel something and now you're pressing on your breast and you're doing that much of the day, you might cause bruising or now it's gonna feel sore or if, and, and then you're gonna start worrying about that. Um, and so sometimes people will make things worse with their behaviors inadvertently. So remember that you have health anxiety. That's the, that's the illness that you have, and that's the illness that needs to be treated. Now, as you go through life, you will have other things, but right now you know you have health anxiety. So if the test results are normal, you do not need to ask for specific numbers. Um, sometimes you get those specific numbers and people get, begin to obsess about that. Flat values are just outside of normal range. It's okay. Right? Just because something is two points higher, two points lower, doesn't mean anything. Um, and you should get medical screenings at recommended intervals. You don't need to get screenings more than that. 
So okay. because okay. Of, we, had, we had a question come in that maybe you can sure. just cover for a moment. Yeah. Uh, one of our audience made a comment that a breathing technique has been very helpful. And I know you covered this in part one. Do you want to just uh, mention that? Oh, that, that was me. <laughs> I was answering oh, that somebody's was you. question. Oh, okay. oh about, that is you. Yes, about COVID. Um, uh -huh. And if um, the COVID anxiety has brought up a lot, if it's brought up some symptoms, um, and I answered the question saying that the restrictions uh, at the beginning of COVID was actually rough for me. Um, I was progressing and then it kind of set me back because all of a sudden I had a lot of this extra time to check for symptoms, to stay in my mind and to continue that behavior. Um, and then I re replied saying that deep breathing helped me a lot. In fact, I'm gonna talk about breathing uh, in a little bit. So we'll talk about that, I will get to that. One, one, okay. more, one more quick question, Ken. We sure. have a question that says, uh, can anxiety cause a tightness in my throat? Yes, absolutely. So people always talk about muscle tension. You know, I feel like tension in my shoulders, but that can happen anywhere. You know, so anywhere from the throat down into the chest, into the stomach area, anywhere you can have tightness, down to your feet, so anxiety can cause a lot of muscle tension anywhere. So sometimes people will feel it in their throat and they might think, oh, my throat is closing up. I can't breathe. Or what if is this throat cancer? Or what if I won't be able to swallow? So uh, people will definitely, that's a definite symptom of anxiety. Can, okay, can so, pain, could pain be related to illness anxiety? If my muscles get so tight, like a headache or a backache or even pain in my arms or legs, is that possible that could be related to anxiety? It, it could be, so if it's definitely muscle tension and you're focusing on that, anytime you focus on something, it's gonna amplify. So um, pain is not necessarily a symptom of anxiety, but by focusing on that pain, you're amplifying it and then you're causing the anxiety. So sometimes it's the reverse where you actually have a physical symptom that's medical and that is worrying you. And then by worrying about it, you're amplifying it. You're making it worse. So in fact, a friend of mine, a colleague of mine has a book called Think Away Your Pain. And it's about how people amplify pain and how they can use their mind to reduce it. So because of neuroplasticity, you can change the wiring of your brain, but it does take patience and hard work. So uh, scientists used to believe that the brain did not change except in a negative way as you go through life, like with loss of memory and slower processing speed. But now we know that the brain changes all the time. The brain is made up of billions of neurons and those neurons reorganize themselves. Um, and one of the ways they reorganize is with repetition, is with doing things over and over and over. So for instance, typing. If you are learning how to type in the beginning, it's very difficult. But if you practice every single day for a half hour, at some point, your fingers seem to magically know where to go. Well, it's not magic. It's, it was your hard work. And as you are learning how to type, the neurons in your brain are beginning to reorganize so that that you can actually type without even thinking about it. Now, if they re, uh, took the keyboard and they changed it somehow, now you'd have to practice all over again with the different keys in different places. But again, as you learn that, your brain kind of rewires itself again. And then if you stopped typing for a couple of years, the nose neuronal pathways are still there and you would still be able to type. So any time you do something repetitively, it strengthens those neuronal pathways in your brain. So the more you worry, you become an expert at worrying, and the more behaviors that you do, you are strengthening those worry, those neuronal pathways that have to do with worry. So you become an expert at worrying and an expert at doing compulsive behaviors. But the good news is we can help you rewire your brain without doing any sort of brain surgery. So that's the good news. So we do that with exposures. So exposures are basically anything you do that where you face, an a fear, uh, face a fear, you are exposing yourself to what you are afraid of. 
So there's different types. There's spontaneous exposure. These are exposures that pop up during the day, just in the course of the day, like you're scrolling through social media and you see a post about cancer and suddenly you become anxious. Now you're spontaneously exposed and triggered. Um, there are planned exposures for practice. So these are things that you do to practice facing your fears. And we're gonna to get to, I'm gonna explain uh, what, that, what that is. And then there's plan exposures in the context of life. So that's like a, a doctor's appointment, it's a physical that you have to go to. It's something that you have to do that's just part of life. It's not for practice, you're doing it for a, a specific reason. So facing your fears will increase your anxiety. So we try to do exposures step by step when we can, starting out small and then gradually building. So I'm gonna give you an example and then I'm gonna entertain some questions. So sometimes people have a fear of getting their blood pressure taken. I get this a lot. Every time they go to the doctor and they take their blood pressure, their blood pressure skyrockets because they're so anxious. But when they're at home, they're fine. So because of the anxiety, their blood pressure is seems like they have high blood pressure but they don't it's just anxiety increasing the blood pressure so what can you do well the first thing that you might want to do is just hold a blood pressure cuff just buy one and while you're watching tv just hold it now initially that might make you anxious but you do it anyways you're going to push through accept the discomfort accept the anxiety and just keep holding it so you might just hold on to it for a while. You know, every day you'll be holding on to this blood pressure cuff. And then you might put it on your arm and sit while you're watching TV with it on your arm. And then maybe you'll start increasing the pressure so you feel that around your arm. And you do that every single day. And then you might watch videos of people getting their blood pressure taken. And again, every time you do an exposure and you step up to the next level, your anxiety will increase. And we'll talk about a certain mindset that you need to have when you face exposures. But just know that your anxiety is gonna increase. And if it's increasing, you're doing it right. And then maybe you'll take your own blood pressure. And this is kind of tricky. I usually recommend people covering up the, the, the so they can't see what, the, what their what their blood pressure is, or maybe they don't even take it, they just practice pushing it and they just kind of feel it. Um, and then maybe they get to the point where they're actually taking it, but not looking. Like it doesn't matter what the score is, you're gonna live with the uncertainty. And then maybe they'll have their spouse or a partner take their blood pressure for them. Again, they're not looking. Their, the, their blood pressure doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter. What you're doing is just practicing taking it and then maybe you'll go to a pharmacy and have someone take your blood pressure and again this all takes practice it's very gradual step by step so um natalia you want to share one of the first exposures that i had you do do you remember um actually you know what you know what hold on i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna come to that so don't answer that question just yet okay, I'm gonna okay. Come to that. But, you know, I also did have a fear of taking my blood pressure. So oh, you did? This, yeah, hearing this just takes me back to that and thinking, oh, wow, how much time has passed and how much, I, how far I've come. <laughs> right, exactly. Neil, have any questions so far that I can answer? No? Okay. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Oh, now I can hear you. Yeah, good. Uh, yeah, a couple of questions just to kind of catch us up, um, and uh, I think you covered one of these already briefly. Uh, so one of the questions is, you know, I have a scheduled routine medical checkup. Going to my medical checkup brings up anxiety. Is that important for me to go anyway, and is that a kind of exposure for me? It is a definite exposure, and you definitely have to go. Annual appointments are extremely important. After all, people with illness anxiety are afraid of illness, and if they don't go, 
they will not know if something is wrong. But that's the reason why they don't go is because they're afraid. So usually people fall into two categories. Some people go to the doctor too much and take too many medical tests, and other people don't go at all because they're so afraid of what they're going to discover. But it is important to go. You need to take care of your health. And um, uh, doing exposures will help you. And I'm going to talk about the mindset, the proper mindset with doing exposures, and that'll probably help you face your fears of uh, going to the doctor a little bit more easily. But just know you're probably going to be anxious going to the doctor. Um, it takes repetition to overcome a fear, doing things over and over and over. So working with patients with a fear of driving, you have to do a lot of driving to overcome that fear. But when you only go to the doctor once a year, it's, you know, you're not doing it very much. And so it's hard to overcome that fear of going to the doctor when it's just once a year. Okay, a couple more questions about exposure. One question comes on, came in when I'm uh, reading my social media feeds that often makes me anxious. Is Does that qualify as an exposure, reading different things that might be coming in on my social media? Should, is that something that's, that's gonna help me? Yeah, so keep this in mind. You wanna have a proper mindset when doing an exposure. So. The first thing I want to point out is you're going to invite it. You're going to invite what you don't want. You're going to want what you don't want, as my friend Reed Wilson will say. You're going to invite the anxiety. So you already know that going on social media, you might see something. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. But the mindset that you need to have is you're playing a game against a tricky opponent. And you're going to be making the first move. This is a move by move game, and you might as well make the first move. So you're going to say, all right, bring it on. Now, what is the it? The it is anxiety, symptoms, thoughts, triggers. So I want you to be prepared when you step onto the court, when you step onto the field, when you step onto the social media game that you're going to be playing. All right, bring it on. Bring on an, an article about cancer. I'm ready. So uh, this is something that I taught Natalia. You want to comment on this? That's the one I wanted to bring up. <laughs> okay. The first oh. exposure was inviting the symptoms, inviting the symptoms, inviting the thoughts, and um, accepting them. That was my first step of acceptance, I want to say, is bring it on. Like, bring it on. Whatever it is you got, I can take it. I can handle it. Right. And so it's counterintuitive because when people have anxiety, that's the last thing they want. They don't want to have anxiety. Exactly. But it's, but it's going to happen anyways. So if it's going to happen anyways, you might as well invite it. And if anyone listening is any sort of an athlete or were an athlete, you know that the mindset of an athlete is bring it on. Let's go. Even if you might be looking across and seeing someone much bigger or stronger, or you know, this better, like, let's bring it on. Right. Um, it's it's like um, heading a soccer ball, you know. When a ball is coming at your head, the natural instinct is to duck or catch it. It's not to hit it with your head, but in soccer, if you want to be good, you have to hit that ball with your head, and you're going to be moving towards it. And so you practice hitting the soccer ball with your head. You're moving your head towards the ball. And if you don't do it correctly, you move your head away, it's going to hit you on the side of the head, which, which is going to hurt, hit you in the face. So, But if you do it correctly with the mindset of, let's go, let me hit this thing, it's not going to hurt as much, not as much. And after a while of hitting it, it doesn't hurt at all. Like similar with volleyball players, you know, it hurts when you're playing volleyball at first, but after hitting a ball, you know, after one week of hitting the ball, the pain seems to go away. So you're like, bring it on, let's hit this thing hard. And I know, Natalia, you, you you used a lot of passion with that. You want to talk about that using like the <laughs> bring it on mentality? Uh, yes. So, I mean, I played sports in high school, so I, I was kind of familiar with that feeling and with that passion. But when I had my anxiety, it just stripped me away from all of the passion that I had. And when you told me to to do that, to bring it on, Pretend you're talking to the anxiety monster and tell him to bring it on. I thought, mm -hmm. okay, yeah, like this is something I hadn't felt in a really long time. So I'm gonna use 
all of my passion and all of my energy to bring it on. If that's what it takes, that's what it takes. And mm -hmm. I just remember feeling confident and I remember feeling like, okay, this is it. You know, this is, this is what's going to help me. And mm -hmm. I can do this. I can overcome this. Yeah. You put yeah. your game face on and I remember you're like, bring yeah. it on, go, right? And it gives yeah. you feeling of empowerment. Empowered, yes. Yes. Right? So it's counterintuitive because usually you're like, no, I don't want this, but that doesn't work. No, so, I invited it completely. You invited, right. <laughs> so now you got to be prepared for and expect symptoms and thoughts. So before you um, do, before you scroll on social media, like, okay, I'm prepared. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm going to expect that there's going to be something. But maybe there won't be anything, though. Maybe there won't be any triggers at all. And then be prepared with your counter strategy. So if anxiety strategy is to trigger you and, you know, brain signals the adrenal gland, now you feel anxious. Okay, now I have to be ready for that because anxiety is going to tell me all sorts of scary things. So if I see something on social media about someone who was diagnosed with ALS, anxiety is going to tell you, your little anxiety monster is going to tell you, oh, what if you get ALS? You know, maybe you have it right now. Is it possible? So you have to be prepared with a counter strategy of what are you going to say to anxiety when anxiety is trying to trick you with these what if thoughts? What are you going to say back? So what did you say back, Natalia, when you had an anxious thought like, oh, what if you have ALS? Do you remember what you would say back? You know, I still have that. You, you had me write them down and I still have that activity. Um, I would say things like bring it on, bring it on for me was probably the number one that I would tell myself, like, bring it on. I got this. I can ride the wave. It's just a wave. It'll pass. It'll happen. No, but what if you have the anxious thought, like the thought, oh, what if you have ALS? How do you do with the oh, thought? Oh, I would stop it in, in its tracks. Because um, oftentimes I'll tell people to say um, something like fake news. Oh, yeah, 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 you're right, you're right, yeah. I would say it's lying. Oh, you're lying. It's not true. Mm -hmm. That's not That's not right. Um, no, it's just a symptom. That's what I would tell myself. It's not true. Now, if you have, if some people have difficulty, well, how do you know it's not true? You might just say, well, not taking the bait. So I'm not taking the bait because anxiety is trying to bait you into a conversation. So when you say I'm not taking the bait, you're like a fish that ignores the bait because if the fish takes the bait, now he's hooked. Now he's in for the struggle. So what you're trying to do is, all right, well, I'm not taking the bait. I'm not going to engage with that. I don't know if it's true or not, but I'm not going to engage with it. Right. So you got to be prepared with your yeah. counter strategy. And then here's focus a, on what you need to do. Here's a suggestion, Ken. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, yeah, go ahead. What, here, from our audience, uh, would a good example be if I answered by saying, that's an irrational thought that makes no sense. Yep, perfect. And then you turn away and focus on something else. Focus on what you need to do instead of the worst possible outcome, right? That's, that's exactly right. That's just my anxiety talking, and then turn away, right? You can use a competing emotion to mitigate that anxiety. So that could be like toughness or humor or amusement. You know, if you get kind of tough with your opponent, um, and again, you respond with a tough way and then you move on and then breathe. Let's talk about breathing. Um, in the anxiety solution series, it's the audio program that I produced. It's a very comprehensive step-by-step -step program that I think Natalia, I think you listened to it. I think, um, yeah. it doesn't, it includes illness anxiety, but it also covers all types of anxiety. And I go into in depth about relaxation breathing and here I'm just going to give you a little bit of an overview when you think of someone having a panic attack what do you think it looks like this <laughs> right so if I'm going to characterize that type of breathing I would say it's fast loud with the mouth and the chest so if that's what anxious breathing is the opposite is relaxation breathing slow silent through the nose and using the abdomen right so you inhale and exhale through the nose. It's slow and it's silent, so you can't hear it. I teach this type of breathing because it's subtle. So you can be around people and breathe and they won't know because it's silent. 
and then your stomach rises when you inhale. Oftentimes people are chest breathers and when they inhale their chest expands and that's not the way you want to do it. You want to develop those stomach muscles, push your stomach out and as you inhale you push your stomach out and you think a relaxing phrase slowly as you're inhaling and exhaling. So for an example the phrase I can relax. So as you're inhaling think to yourself I can and then you pause and then you'll exhale relax right um, breathe for a few minutes you know adrenaline enters the body quickly and it takes several minutes for the body to kind of come down and manage your expectations so this uh, relaxation breathing think of it as like an umbrella in the rain the umbrella is not meant to stop the rain it's there to help you get through the rain you're probably still going to get a little wet so when you're anxious the breathing is there to help you kind of get through the anxiety not necessarily to stop it take it away it's to help you get through it so natalia you want to share how breathing was helpful for you and anything about the anxiety solution series you want to say yeah um the deep breathing for me has been the number one thing that I that, that I feel has helped me calm my body down, calm the stress down, um, and calm my thoughts down. Like you said, like I can relax. Um, I remember you told me if if I had ever felt that, or if I had felt like I can just do nothing and be still. And I remember thinking, no, I cannot be still. And the deep breathing has helped me be still and be calm. Um, yeah, this, for me, the deep breathing is something I still do to this day. I practice it daily and it's, it's a lifestyle for me now. Good. I, I usually tell people in the beginning, you know, practice somewhere between five to 10 times a day for six breaths, which is basically a one minute of practice just throughout the day, throughout the day. And then if you're anxious, then you'll do it longer. But if you don't practice it, it won't work when you're anxious. You have to practice it when you're not anxious. Yep. Yeah, yeah. so I, I do a lot of that. Well, there we go. Practice several times a day. So when people have a, um, a fear, they have to confront the fear. So you got a fear of taking your blood pressure. you got to face the fear and take your blood pressure. Someone has a fear of elevators, they got to get in the elevator. Someone has a fear of flying, you got to get on that plane eventually. And if someone has a fear of public speaking, you got to speak in public. But how do you ex do an exposure when the fear is death, when the fear is cancer, when the fear is ALS? Well, we do it in a different way, obviously. And how do we do that? Well, we face the fears in your imagination. That's how we do it. So um, I'm going to take you, everyone here, through uh, an exposure right now same exposure I did with Natalia I'll describe it first and then we'll kind of go through it as a as a group so oftentimes people with illness anxiety worry about hearing certain words they worry about whenever they hear a triggering word and for each person it's different so we have to learn that the words only have as much power as you give them the words only have as much power as you give them. So when you hear a certain word you are, and you're feeling anxious, you give that word a lot of power. So the only way to reduce the anxiety connected with certain words and phrases is to expose yourself to those words and phrases. And we do it slowly, step by step. So for Natalia, it was saying words like ALS and MS primarily. Right. And what was it like for you when you would say these words out loud? Oh, it was definitely scary. Definitely. It was really scary at first because I thought that if I said it and I put it out there, then I will definitely manifest it and, and have it later on. So I had this deep fear of calling it out into existence, so to speak. Yeah, that is a really common uh, symptom of illness anxiety is where you feel like if I say it, I'm putting it out there in the universe and it's going to come back at me. Exactly. No. <laughs> if that were true, you should say a lot of positive things. Then maybe, right. you know, I'm going <laughs> to find a $100 bill today. 
<laughs> but again, thoughts only have as much power as you give them. So what I would do is let's start off with this here. Oh, so let, let's go through this first, sorry. So um, easily triggered by words you hear and read. So if you're having a conversation, someone says something, it triggers you. Um, anxiety sufferers give their thoughts too much power. And if you want to overcome it, you got to face it. You know, how do you acclimate to a cold swimming pool? Well, you got to get in the pool, you move around, and then your body acclimates to it. So when we, we're going to do this exposure now, we're going to say, bring it on. And we're going to bring on a, a, a word. All right. So Natalia, I'll take this. I'll do this with you. But everyone can do this at home. Just say the word out loud when you see it appear on the screen. Ready? All right. So Natalia, say, bring it on. Okay. Bring it on. Now say the word. Earthquake. Earthquake. Okay. All right. Now, does that bring up anxiety for you? Yeah, I guess if you've been in an earthquake before, perhaps, but maybe not. All right. All right. So say, bring it on again. Bring it on. Bring it on. Murder. Murder. Uh, did it, you know, anything cause you any anxiety? No. All right. All right. Say it again. Say, bring, bring it, it on. on. Bring it on. Fatal car accident. Fatal car accident. Okay. Bring it on. Cancer. Cancer. Mm -hmm. Bring it on. Bring it on. Stroke. Stroke. Mm -hmm. Bring now, it right on. Now, sometimes when people will say these, like, all right, they're feeling kind of anxious. They're seeing these words. Okay, take a deep breath. Inhale slowly through your nose, really slowly and silently. Have your stomach expand. And as you're inhaling, think the words, I can. As you exhale, think the words, relax. Right? These are just words. That's all they are. They're words. All right, Natalia, give me it to me again. Bring it on. Bring it on. Brain tumor. Right. Bring it on. ALS. Bring and it is on. That, does that trigger you when you see that now? No. 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 Pretty easy. No triggers. Yeah, it's pretty right. easy. Yeah. All right. One more time. Bring it on. Parkinson's disease. Right. Bring it on. Yeah, it's, it's just words. All right. So now what's really important when you're doing exposure work is to repeat the exposure. Like I said in the beginning, you rewire your brain with repetition. You know, you're not you can't become a good typist without practicing typing. You do it over and over and over. And by doing it over and over and over, you begin to desensitize to these words. And after a while, they don't trigger anything. All right, so say bring it on once, and then every time it appears on the screen, say, say it out loud, and everyone do this at home too. All right, say everyone say, bring it on. Bring it on. Earthquake. Bring it on. It? No, just say the words as you as I'm saying, putting them out. Fatal car accident. Fatal car accident. Cancer. Cancer. Stroke. Stroke. Brain, Brain tumor. tumor. ALS. ALS. Parkinson's, Parkinson's disease. Right. OK, so now. If people have, are having difficulty, one of the things that you could do is divert your attention while you're saying these words. So, for instance, as you're saying these words, every time you say the word, if you take if you have a ball, you just kind of throw it up in the air or it just could be anything. Just throw it up in the air and catch it. So cancer. So now you're focusing more on throwing it up and catching the ball than hearing the word itself. And it kind of takes away some of the power of that word. So if there's a certain word or words that trigger you, you just throw the ball up and say the word at the same time, just kind of keep doing that. And then after a while, put the ball down and just keep saying the word. You can even record it and hear, your, hear it. So you can record yourself saying these words over the course of two minutes and then listen back as you're washing the dishes, for instance. So increasing the duration is important. 
So if you want to overcome the fear of elevators, you got to get in the elevator, do it repeatedly. But, you know, once you go to the first floor, now you're going to go to the second floor and the third floor and you stay in longer. It's the duration. So now what we're going to do is we're going to leave these words up on the screen. So let me hear you say, bring it on. Bring on the anxiety. I can handle it. Bring it on. Bring, it Bring on, on the anxiety. It. I can handle it. Fatal car accident. ALS. ALS. Brain, Brain tumor. tumor. Earthquake. Earthquake. Stroke. Stroke. Murder. Murder. Cancer. Cancer. Parkinson's, Parkinson's disease. Good job. Excellent. This is hard work. For a lot of people, this is really, really hard work. I mean, I think it was hard, right? In the beginning, Natalia? Yeah. In the beginning, it was really hard. Yeah. Really, really hard. Okay. So another thing you can do, in addition to um, tossing a ball, if you want to uh, help, is add some amusement to it. So Natalia, I'm going to have you say these words using an accent. Um, it could be any accent. You can do whatever accent you're good at, or even if you're not good at it, English, French, Italian, whatever you want. So I'm going to put these words up, and now you're going to say the words using an accent. Because we're going to try to make these words sound silly. We're going to take away their power. That's what we're trying to do. Merda. Parkinson's disease. Earthquake. Brain tumor. Fatal car accident. Oh, now you're Italian. Fatal car accident. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, do the next one with Italian. Uh, a stroke. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can you do an uh, English? Can you try an English accent? Let's see. Cancer. <laughs> It's hard to switch <laughs> accents. The best I can do. <laughs> ALS. ALS. <laughs> We're just having fun. <laughs> We're just trying to take away the power of these words. All right. So now we try to increase the intensity. So this time we're going to say these words louder, like in a louder voice. Ready? And this is the last time we're going to do this. And we're going to move, move on to questions for everybody. All right. Louder voice. Earthquake. ALS. Murder. Brain tumor. Parkinson's disease. Louder. Fatal car accident. <laughs> Stroke. Cancer. All right. Good job. Excellent. Very good. Very good. So um, I do not have a book on illness anxiety, but I will probably write one. So check back in a couple of years. But I have other things. I have the Anxiety Solution Series, which is an audio program which covers illness anxiety, the Midophobia Manual for People with Fear of Throwing Up. Stress Free, which is a series of relaxation CDs, and Break Free from Anxiety, which is a uh, coloring self-help book. So every chapter um, has a coloring illustration, which is very meditative. So if you're anxious about something, you can you can uh, draw and color. Um, but I wanted to open so, up for now for questions and comments for people. Yeah, great. So we have a couple ask. of questions before we start winding up. Uh, some really great questions. Um, oh, so first of all, uh, there have been several people that asked if you about your availability for virtual sessions. Uh, should people contact you through your website? Yeah, you can contact me through email, probably. Um, Ken Goodman LCSW at yahoo.com. I usually have a waiting list, but I'm happy to talk with people and see what I can do to get people in. Ken Goodman, LCSW at yahoo.com. Um, so feel free. Uh, we had a very interesting question. So let's say I'm uh, having some 
physical symptoms and I'm not sure, maybe there's something medical, maybe it's my health anxiety and my doctor concludes that uh, it's not a medical condition. Should I rely on my general practitioner to treat my illness anxiety or should I look for a therapist like you that has some background in uh, these kinds of tools that you're introducing? Well, if you have illness anxiety, you definitely need to see a professional. You know, a psychiatrist is useful to, pres to prescribe medicine as well as a therapist who specializes in the treatment of anxiety. Everyone, all therapists treat anxiety, but they don't all do it well. And so you really want to find someone who specializes in it, does cognitive behavioral therapy, acceptance, commitment therapy, exposure and response prevention. And usually the people on the ADAA website who are listed there have that expertise. We have a really interesting question. I think early on in the webinar you covered, uh, hey, don't become Dr. Google. See if you can stop checking things on your own. Rely on your medical professional. Uh, so one question, my health issue is, or my health anxiety is about melanoma, and I have a mole on my face. How do I keep from checking it when I'm looking at myself in the mirror? Oh, that's a great question. So you do the best you can. I mean, first, you always want to get things checked out. So if you see something unusual, you know, particularly if you have a history of skin cancer in the family, you know, you, you need to get things checked out. You just don't want to keep going back to the doctor repeatedly. So once the doctor says, oh, this is fine, then it's like, okay, I'll just believe him it's fine. And then I'll get it checked out when I go back the following year. Um, but in terms of not checking your face, I mean, there's different ways to that people look in the mirror. So you can look at it closely and really examine that. And what is that? Or you can just look in the mirror and brush your teeth and blow dry your hair and then go on. So you're always going to see it, um, particularly if it's right there on your face. But you try not to examine it. And you do the best you can with not examining it. And look and focus on the other aspects of your face. If you're you know, blow drying your hair, focus on your hair. But you can't, it's gonna be in your vision, so. Here's another really good question. Um, my physical symptom is headache and my illness anxiety is about uh, having a stroke. Uh, how do I do an exposure to the headache? Good question. So remember, headaches are extremely common. Everyone gets headaches and strokes are not that common. It happens, but they're not nearly as common as a headache. So in terms of headaches, what you should probably do is every morning when you wake up, say, all right, bring on a headache. Just bring it on. And then there'll be many days you don't even get a headache. But then certain days you will and you'll be ready. You'll just be more prepared. So rather than not wanting a headache, say, all right, bring it on. Give me a headache today. I need to practice. I need to practice. So bring it on. I have to, what, and what are you practicing? You're practicing responding in a different way. So invite it. Okay, so I think we'll start to wind up. Uh, Ken, thank you so much. Natalia, thank you for, oh, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Yeah, Ken, thank you so much. Natalia, thank you so much uh, for being a, uh, a role model for everybody. Yes, uh, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Does no, anyone have you. any questions for, was there any questions for Natalia? Uh, Did you see any? Okay, yeah. Here, uh, well, here's another question uh, for you, Ken. Uh, how, how have the exposures changed with COVID? the kinds of exposures that we do. Uh, any particular insight about anything different I need to do with COVID with these kinds of exposures? We're well, it's interesting. About. I have an illness anxiety group for my patients and there's, they, they're really worried about other things, not about COVID. It's very interesting. Okay. Um, but you know, if you have anxiety about COVID, that's a totally different talk. But again, you're doing exposures, you're doing the same sort of thing and slowly eliminating safety behaviors. So let's say for instance, you would normally leave a package on your 
front porch for an entire day before you bring it in. Maybe you'll bring it in after a half a day and then slowly increase. One more question. Uh, the fear of dying. Uh, and, and you covered that those life threatening illness words. Any other comments about overcoming my fear of death that might be helpful to our audience? Before yeah, we you know, fear of death is like, okay, everyone is going to die at some point. It, 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 we're all going to die. But we don't necessarily have to think about that. It's not something we have to engage with our anxiety monster about about death. And I think when people are afraid of death, they're thinking about it way too much. I mean, the average person who does not have a fear of death, we just don't think about it ever. It doesn't come up. So you're trying not to engage with anxiety. So you're going to respond with not taking the bait every time anxiety tries to engage you in a discussion about, about death. There is a question I saw from Natalia. How long in treatment before you felt relief of symptoms? Um, you know, looking back, I want to say relief of symptoms maybe two months in. Two months in. I want to say about two months. But we really only worked for about, I want to say, three months, right? Now, Natalia is a little different. So she, I think, had illness anxiety for about maybe four or five months before you saw yeah. Me, that. Yeah. So it was, it's very different. If you've been having symptoms, if you've been having illness anxiety for 20 years, 10 years, again, those neuronal pathways are now strongly, uh, your brain is wired to be anxious. So because it hadn't been that long, it was a little easier and a little more quicker to overcome that those fears because it you right. hadn't been suffering for a really long long time i mean five months probably felt like five years but like forever <laughs> yeah so it's you know but the longer you suffer with it the longer it's going to take to overcome yeah so don't be frustrated if you know you're having symptoms and thoughts for a while so thank you again ken thank you natalia uh, thanks everybody for watching uh, please like it and share it. And if you have a question that we didn't cover, uh, feel free to email your questions to webinars at adaa.org. Uh, so bye, everybody, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank right, you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.